A lot of the same stuff. Reed with Cynics Eye, Progeny. Who are these knuckleheads behind this company? And shoe leather. Use the product, see how it works. Um, and, and in the interest of time and technology, I'm not going to show you the, the stories that resulted. But here's a company, Zynga. Billion dollars in revenue, just turned profitable, groundbreaking business model of a virtual, durable good. That sounds great. It's durable, but you don't have to make it? Or it sounds really stupid. Um, uh, but a digital tractor, incredible valuation, seven times sales, 77 times earnings. Does anyone know what a virtual durable good is? That's because you can't, because it's virtual. But, it, but uh, what they tried to do accounting-wise was change the revenue recognition. So I want to, first I want you to think about this. Uh, think about what a tractor is and how valuable a tractor might be. Let's, uh, let's just make up a number. Let's say a tractor costs $100,000, like a crappy little tractor, right? How long is that tractor going to be good for? And how do you account for the changing value? Maybe it's good for... I mean, I mean, you know, my, my, I got, I've got family in the Midwest. So they've got some old tractors that have been around that family for 30 years. So maybe they can, they can depreciate that over the course of 30 years. Maybe um, uh, they can recognize uh, the revenue from a sale over a certain long period of time. Because maybe, for example, if, if, if you sold someone a tractor and you said, or you lease it to them, you said, I will take care of this tractor for the next 30 years if you pay me uh, $1,000. Or so I'll make the numbers even easier. If you pay me $30,000, to take care of this tractor, I will take care of it for 30 years. That's easy, you take $1,000 a year. So you put $30,000 aside, and in year one you take 1,000 bucks off out of that, that account, right? That's this, this, is, this is how you sort of, this is how you account for revenues when you have a service contract. So after year one, you've got $29,000 in the bank, and you recognize $1,000 of revenue. And after year two, you take another $1,000, you've got 28,000 in the bank, and you've recognized another $1,000 in revenue. And in year three, you take another $1,000 out, you've got 27,000 left, and you've got $1,000 in revenue. And that's a great business model, because you've already collected the cash, you just recognize that revenue, rateably, over you know, $1,000 every year, or every period, whatever you think is right. And that's, those, that's why those service business models are great, because you collect the money up front, you know you've got it, you just have to continue to provide the service, or promise to take care of the tractor. Zynga did the same thing for their virtual tractors. They said, if you're going to play our game and you buy a virtual tractor, we promise to deliver, let you use that tractor for as long as you play the game. Problem is, Zynga's only been around for nine months or a year or two. They don't know how long someone's going to play Farmville. I mean, how long do you play Farmville? Like, how would you know how long? I mean, you can guess until you get bored. How long is Zynga responsible for that? What if the customer says, hey, I only played it for a few months. You already collected for it, but you've got to, you've got to continue to operate your servers. right? You've got to, you know, like the, it's not that the customer is going to come back to you and say, I want my money back. But you've, you have to continue to provide the servers. You have to continue to keep electricity on. You've got to continue to have people to fix the code when the code breaks. So one thing you wouldn't think Zynga is doing in the, in the months before it does an IPO is dramatically change its revenue recognition of these virtual durable goods, especially since the customer, the game isn't, isn't even nine months old yet. And yet, in the S1, which is the filing that they put out called, sometimes called the red herring or the IPO filing, Zynga said the estimated weighted average of life of a, the life of a virtual good in our new bookings, the things we, ju we just freaking made this digital tractor, in 2009 it was 18 months. And then it was, two th it was 13 months in 2010. Wait, what? Really? exactly five months difference in one year. We've noticed it's going to have an exactly a five months. And yet, the first quarter, if they go public, the estimated way, 12 months for the second quarter and 14 months for the second quarter of the year before. Right, so they're reversing it, right? So they're, they're, they used to go prior year, future year. Now they go future year, prior year. Why? To confuse you. If you're confused, it's working. They're confusing you. But they're changing it from 14 months to 12 months. They're shrinking the period. So you remember my example of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, what, 30 years of a tractor, $1,000 a year? What if I said, OK, first year, I take my 1000 bucks out. How much is left of my $30,000? 29, very good. You subtracted 1 from 30. You did that all in your heads. It's very impressive. Um, let's say in the next year, I take another $1,000 out. My revenue recognition policy is still 30 years. How much money is left? 28, and I've taken $1,000 this year, right? 
Let's say I cut my revenue recognition in half. And I say after the second year, you know what? I think they're only going to do it for 15 years. I'm going to provide service for 15 years. And I move to my next year of revenue. How much revenue do I take now? 2,000. I double my revenue without changing my sales whatsoever. And what happens to what's left there, which was down to 28? It's down to 26. And let's say I do it again. I'm going to go from 15 years to seven and a half years. My next year, when I had, what did I say, 26 left in the bank, how much do I take out for this year? $4,000. I've gone from $1,000 in revenue to $2,000 in revenue to $4,000 in revenue, and all I've done is change a sentence in my S1, my quarterly filing. Zynga, right before the IPO, saw revenues accelerate dramatically. And I will tell you, I talked to every single analyst on Wall Street who covers this stock, and not one of them saw this. And I'm a reporter on TV now. I'm wearing makeup for a living. So Zynga, uh, you can't see my report on this when I try to point this out. Uh, you'll have to, uh, to uh, accept my uh, to belief in this. Um, this is what happened to the stock price, which you guys may know. What you might not remember is when the stock was up there at 15 instead of, you know, four here, three or four. Do you know what the company did uh, when it, after that straight zoom up after the IPO? You want to guess? Anybody? Somebody. The insider has sold shit tons of stock, which is a mathematical term for a billion dollars. So the CEO, while they're making these changes in the revenue recognition, and also did something for the employees, told them they couldn't sell any stock. So all the employees were locked up because they filed for a secondary, with the exception of the top three senior executives. And the top executives were allowed to sell, and all the employees were frozen for another six months. So that happened. This guy is a CEO of a public traded, traded company, or he was. And you might ask yourself, why wouldn't I take this guy seriously? <laughs> because they have incredible revenue, $713 million, revenue growth of 22,411%, which is good. Um, what is their business proposition? They're going to create a new way to sell shit. That's a good idea. New ways for local merchants to attract customers and sell goods and services. That's, that's a good idea. You should find a new way to sell things. Um, uh, presumably they have a new better way. Uh, spectacular $11 billion valuation. Nine times trailing sales. And unencumbered by profit. That's not a good thing. Um, $1 billion in insider selling before they even do an IPO. If the future is so bright, why are these guys taking a billion dollars out before they've done anything yet? Who are these guys? I will tell the story briefly of Eric Lefkowski, the chairman of the company. Not the guy in the, in the diapers, but the guy in, or his tidy whities whatever. But, uh, sorry, that was me, uh, his tidy whities um, uh, Eric Lefkowski, in fact, is the biggest shareholder, not that, that kid. Um, Eric, Eric's, Eric's full grown, he's you know, in his late 40s, 50. Um, he started a company called Brandon Apparel, borrowed money from the state of Wisconsin, uh, got community empowerment loans to build the company, uh, went into, a fa into an urban area, uh, employed these people to make stuff. Uh, as soon as he got all the money, he shut down the factory, fired all the people, took the money according to the lawsuits afterwards and started a software company. The city sued, the bank sued, his other investors sued, he started a software company, he sold it with a software that he developed according to the lawsuits at Brandon Apparel. He, so he started a company called it Starbelly. That's another story entirely. Uh, started Starbelly, sold it to a company called Halo. Halo bought the software for $400 million and uh, said, wait, wait a minute, this doesn't work. The software doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. In fact, Ernst & Young went out and did an analysis of it afterwards and said, not only does the software not work, it's not original. They probably didn't even write the code. It looks like they just bought software from somewhere and then put in a different name on it and sold it to you. Uh, nonetheless, that company went bankrupt, the stock is delisted. They take the same software, something just like it, and start a company called Inner Workings in Chicago. Take that thing public. That thing goes public, uh, has a, a $700 million market cap and no earnings and no accumulated profits. And then they take the exact same software that works for printing. This finds a, supposedly matches uh, people who want to print stuff with print shops that aren't doing anything. 
and then they take the same software in the same building on the same floor with the same address and the same executives, the same CEO, the same COO, the same two big shareholders, and they start a new company with a new asset, a software that magically introduces printers to print, oh no, sorry, and it automatically introduces shippers to people that want to ship something. And they call that one Echo Global Logistics, and they put that uh, in, in their, uh, in, in, uh, uh, these are made up names, of course. Uh, they put that in, in a, 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 the same building, same kind of business model. Some of the pages in the IPO filing look almost like the pages in the other IPO filing, and they take that public. And that thing has de minimis accumulated earnings, uh, fantastic valuation, doesn't seem to make any sense. And oh, yeah, the owners of this company that had the same software get just a tiny little sliver. But these guys take chunks of it, even though this is supposedly owned by the public, not owned by these guys. And then they start another company, and they call it Groupon. So I'm thinking, OK, progeny. It's good to know who these guys are, what they've done in the past. They've been sued by investors there. They've been sued at the first company. They've been sued by investors at Starbelly. They were sued by investors at Halo. And they start these companies and then this one. So you got a, you got a, a trail of tears from, invest, from shareholders or business partners suing. And you've got these other two companies that haven't really done much. And then you've got this magical company group on where they're selling a billion dollars. Question in the back. Yeah, I mean, so look, some people probably knew. Look, here's, some people knew and got involved anyway. Some people knew and stayed the hell away. And some people didn't know. And what they're counting on, I think, is the people who didn't know. Um, and you gotta do the work. I mean, you gotta, look, they, this is, if you read this prospectus, it's not gonna tell you that story. The only, I'll give you one second, the only, the only reason I knew about these guys was because in this prospectus, there was a, a or I'm sorry, I, 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 was, I was looking up a different company named Halo. And this one had a hyphen, and the one I was looking up didn't have a hyphen. And I found this by accident. I, I, I read this really messed up sentence in the, in the SEC filing for this company that said, our former uh, principal shareholder uh, was involved in a bankruptcy before, but he doesn't have this share. No, the wife of our largest shareholder, who was our founder, who was no longer involved in the company, was involved in a bankruptcy once upon a time, and the shares are held by a foundation. And I'm like, what kind of game of twister is that? Like, there's no yoga move to describe what that sentence just tried to do. <laughs> and so I just tried to figure out, who is this guy? What is this company? Doing LexisNexis searches, doing searches on the interweb thing. Uh, like, trying to, like, who is this guy? Like, why is he trying to hide his involvement in this company? Which, by the way, a couple years later, he was the chairman of and then the CEO of, and this whole, like, oh, it's in his wife's trust, and as, you know, that came unwound pretty fast. By the way, he's also became CEO of this thing when this started to blow up. Um, I did, a, did do a story about that, and a story about who he was, um, and he, which he was none too thrilled about. Um, called me, uh, 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 and, you know, even going back, like this, this, this one, when this one started to come unwound, he sent an email, which later came up in a lawsuit, saying, Let's just, let's tell the analysts anything. Let's be wildly positive in all of our estimates. Otherwise, we are fried like fucking chickens. His words, not mine. Um, so, and after the, so, and even in the reporting during the IPO, they had to reduce their revenue numbers a lot. They, they, were, they were sort of double counting their revenues. They had to take those down a lot. The stock came out, it was just an utter, utter collapse and failure. That's the progeny test. And really quickly, one more company, and we're almost over, over time. Uh, this company is called Facebook. Uh, you may not be familiar with it. Um, really incredible revenue, is $3.7 billion. Very profitable, profitable, imagine that, billion dollar profit. Uh, 845 million monthly active average users. Every growth metric is slowing down dramatically, every single one. Um, and they do a $100 billion IPO to high valuation. Um, and I won't show you what, what you know this video because it takes too much. But what I sort of did is sort of figured out how could they grow? And if they fix this, if they fix mobile, if they can get into China, if they can get into Africa, if they can increase the value per user, this could actually be worth something. And they've got a lot of runway to do so because they've got so much free cash flow. And, and uh, what, what I said in my piece, even then, you'll just have to believe me because I, I couldn't possibly, I, I said if it ever got to 19, it'd probably be worth buying. And it fell to like 1890 or something, and it did a complete bounce. And they fixed mobile, which, which they said in their IPO, they had zero revenues from, no, I think they said something like no 
appreciable revenues uh, for mobile. And they fixed stuff. Um, uh, and I wish I was this smart when I was really running money, although it's mostly on the short side, because this company has turned out to be you know, one of the great companies. Um, Appendix, Mini Minnesota Bulldozer was acquired by another company. That's the stock of the other company, which totally collapsed afterwards. <laughs> um, I couldn't decide which picture to use of the serious CEO. I went with the tidy whitey, so that's, that's one I like as well. I did not leave us time for questions, not least of which because I got here so late. Uh, again, I want to remind you, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, and, I, and, and you'd be a fool to listen to me.